I'm Michael Krasny, and I am pleased to welcome you to another episode of the weekly Gray Matter with Michael Krasny podcast. Today's episode features an in-depth and wide-ranging conversation with a leading and internationally celebrated Stanford scientist and head of the Baxter Lab for Stem Cell Biology, Dr. Helen Blau, a Harvard PhD who is a pioneer in the development of stem cell biology and regenerative medicine, as well as a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine, is also a successful entrepreneur, having co-founded a biopharmaceutical company in 2017 devoted to the building of muscle strength and enhancement of the regenerative process by capitalizing on the body's own healing mechanisms. The following year, 2018, Dr. Blau was elected to the American Philosophical Society. She holds 20 patents and has done a great deal of mentoring of young women. We're going to talk about all of that and more, and especially young women in science, as well as she is an accomplished scuba diver. And we, well, I'm going to welcome your questions and comments to this episode, and I welcome Dr. Helen Blau to Gray Matter with Michael Krasny. Delighted to have you here with us. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I thought, I mean, I'm remembering the last time that we had occasion to be in conversation and we were talking about embryonic stem cells, and it was such a huge controversy then, and it seems to have died down now. I mean, you even went with the Pope about that, although your field is not embryonic stem cells, it's more in the other areas of stem cell research. But why has this died down so much, do you think? Oh, I think because we now have alternatives. We don't need to use embryos to get stem cells. Um, since the discovery of Shinya Yamanaka, who received the Nobel Prize a few years ago, uh, we're able to take cells from any part of your body, typically blood, skin, urine, and convert them to pluripotent cells, induced pluripotent cells. And these have the same properties as embryonic stem cells. So you can take your own cells and make them into embryonic uh, stem cell-like cells. And so that uh, overcomes those problems. Yeah, and uh, all those alternatives are now e existent and fairly easily accessible, but human embryos are still very much in demand for research, aren't they? Yes, we need both. Uh, for research, in order to really understand development and to compare the induced pluripotent cells against the gold standard, which is the embryo, uh, we need to study both for sure. So what um, were you talking about when you went to the Vatican? You met... <laughs> Benedict, I think, and you also met yes, Pope Francis. Yeah. yeah, it's been a fantastic experience. I'm on the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. There are 80 elected members for life, and we advise the Pope on anything from climate change uh, to astrophysics and um, and stem cells. So I held the first meeting of on, on stem cells organized by women. I think it was the first meeting at the Vatican organized entirely by women last year. Um, and it was a fantastic experience. We had uh, world leaders from everywhere. It's, it's the only meeting where everyone I invited said yes, and everyone came. There were no cancellations at all because it is such a unique experience. And the you digs live, are pretty good too, yeah, aren't they? I mean, That's they, right. Yeah, yeah. You, you live in the hotel, uh, the Vatican hotel, where the cardinals live when they elect the pope. And so we stay in those rooms and, and you see the Pope at breakfast occasionally as well. And we have an audience with the Pope and a visit to the papal palace. And uh, the site of the meeting, this uh, Pia Cosma um, Center, is not accessible to anyone else. And my friends in Rome who've grown up in Rome are, are quite envious that I've seen the Vatican grounds and gardens and... Uh, and this special uh, place, and also access to the Sistine Chapel without people there. Yeah, so, that's extraordinary. Fantastic experience. Uh, and something that you can brag about for uh, many years to come, we hope, uh, and show all the photographs. I I'm interested, though, in the, the future of stem cell research and where it can be headed, in your judgment. I mean, at one time, they were talking about it as a cornucopia, almost, of all kinds of great possibilities. You know, we were going to not only live longer, and that's still in the works, but we're going to be able to heal so many different things and so forth. Mm -hmm. Where are we now? Can you just give us kind of the pulse of things? Yeah. So one of the things, uh, there, there are different types of stem cells. So there are the pluripotent stem cells, embryonic and induced pluripotent, 
And these you can engineer to become different kinds of cells and use them for cell therapy, for cell replacement. And the poster child for that has been epidermal uh, uh, bullosa, epidermal lysis bullosa, it's a mouthful, EBD. And <laughs> this is a disease of blistering of the skin due to a genetic defect. And uh, it's the poster child for stem cell treatments right now. Uh, Michele De Luca in Italy found that he could uh, take the cells from a boy with EBD who had who had been in hospital ever since his birth, unable to go to school, unable to play. And he engineered the, the stem cells that were self-renewing in the skin and was able to replace them throughout the body of the, of the boy. And the boy now is going to school and playing soccer, in fact. So this is a, a real triumph and shows you what stem cells can do. Yeah, I love those um, kind of stories. But you actually are the recipient of something called the Glenn Award for Biological Research and Aging, and stem cell certainly are going to extend longevity too. I mean, that's yeah. been in the works, as I said, all along. Right. Yes, and my focus is really tissue-specific stem cells. These are stem cells that reside in your tissues and are dedicated to repairing the tissues of your body throughout your life. So, for instance, when when you play soccer and you you fall and you damage your muscles, uh, the stem cells kick in and regenerate the muscle. If you break a bone, the stem cells kick in and uh, repair the bone. They come to your rescue. You have stem cells in your skin. You have them in almost every tissue, and they are dedicated to repairing that tissue. And so one of the approaches, which is what I am doing, is trying to, um, so with aging, those cells function less well, and we want to find ways to stimulate them and to rejuvenate them so that they function better, even in the aged tissue. And, and that's a major goal of our research and, and others that I think is very promising. Other things one could do with stem cells that are in clinical trials are, for instance, macular degeneration, which I know is of interest to a lot of uh, aging people where you lose your vision due to the lack of retinal pigment cells and photoreceptors. Uh, and now there are clinical trials in which you take these pluripotent cells so you take a person's blood cells, you convert them to pluripotent cells, then you convert them to retinal pigment epithelial cells, and then you transplant them into the site uh, in the eye where those retinal pigment epithelial cells would normally be. And, and uh, many people are able to see again instead of having this uh, fog of wavy um, uh, loss of vision. Their That's vision more can the, be restored. what they call the wet, uh, as opposed to the dry macular degeneration? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I want to make that distinction. Uh, but also, uh, stem cells uh, essentially get dysfunctional as we age. So how do you replenish them? That's being done so too, when, isn't it? Yes. So one way is to take cells you engineer and put them back in. Um but another way is to stimulate the stem cells that are in place. And, and that's the focus of my lab. And uh, what we decided is we'd, we'd found many ways to rejuvenate the cells in culture, isolate them and plate them in a dish and add different factors. But we wanted to be able to stimulate them in the body. And we reasoned that one of the first things that happens that stimulates a stem cell is damage. And that's associated with inflammation. So we looked for inflammatory regulators and we found prostaglandin E2 is one of the first that comes up after an injury. And uh, the stem cells are exquisitely sensitive to PGE2. If you eliminate, genetically eliminate the receptor, for instance, on the stem cells in a mouse, uh, after injury, they can't replace the stem cell. They can't regenerate the tissue and they become weaker. So it's absolutely required and essential for the function of the stem cells. In fact, if you block the synthesis of PGE2, which happens if you uh, give the mouse an NSAID, and an NSAID is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent like ibuprofen. Um, if you do that, you are blocking the function of the stem cells. And this is important because when you uh, jog or work out in the gym and you wanna build your muscle, you are actually doing little micro damages to the muscle and you need the PGE2 
that is el elucid el that is uh, released when you do um, exercise. You need that in order to stimulate the stem cells to get them to regenerate the tissue and build the muscle. And so if you take an ibuprofen and you block your endogenous synthesis of PGE2, you're negating all the good you did with your uh, marathon run or workout in the gym. So no pain, no gain. This is a very, very literally key true, pathway. Yeah. Yeah, it's literally true. It's a key pathway, and your muscle stem cells absolutely rely on prostaglandin E2. So you're increasing the prostaglandins, basically, aren't you? The pathways yes. as well as the prostaglandins mm -hmm. themselves, right? Yes. Um, so we're talking about aging and prostaglandins. I'm also inclined to ask you about telomeres because these are the things that hang on to chromosomes and uh, have a lot to do with aging. And I know Elizabeth Blackburn here, yeah. we're in the Bay Area, has won a Nobel Prize for her work in that. That's really quite promising as well. It, it, we're talking more gray-like in gray matter, but gray is more the ambiguity of grayness than it is. At least that was our intention. Uh, but we talked recently to Ken Dyke while we did a podcast with him, mm -hmm. one of the leading gerontologists. Uh, but tell me about telomeres from your standpoint, uh, because sure. again, there's been a lot of hope attached. Yeah. Liz Blackburn is a good friend of mine. In fact, we we hang out in Paris and go around together. <laughs> and, um, she, so telomeres are the caps on the ends of chromosomes, and they shorten with aging, as you said, and uh, primarily with um, cell division. Your telomeres become progressively shorter, and that's part of aging. Um, in fact, in my lab, we discovered a way to increase telomerase, which is the enzyme that is required to increase the length of telomeres. And um, a postdoc and a student from my lab founded a company, of which I'm a founder as well, Rejuvenation Technologies, which is based on telomere extension. Uh, so I think it's very promising. And um, one of the aspects that we found in our lab is that telomeres shorten even in uh, cardiomyocytes, which don't divide. And that can be due to the stress of contraction in the absence of a key contractile protein, as happens with uh, cardiac failure due to gen genetic cardiomyopathies, dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophy. Um, and the telomeres shorten. And so uh, we wanted to find ways in which to preserve the telomeres or even lengthen them. And one way is to deliver what's called a Sheltrin protein which is uh, a protein that binds to the telomeres and protects them. So that's one way. Another way is to extend them through telomerase. So I think there's a lot of promise to Indeed. Uh, yeah. Yeah, approaches, but it's always uh, a balancing act as well. And when you were talking about postdoctoral work, um, I didn't realize that you had done your postdoctoral work with Charles Epstein, who I knew, uh, again, I don't want to get too barrier-centric here, but... Yeah. Um, he was Lived a victim of the Unabomber. Yep. And uh, yes. I never understood, you know, I mean, I actually read Kaczynski and uh, started to glean what he was all about. There were ingenious things about him and there were also, you know, these kind of madness and everything. But yeah. there was nothing about Charlie, Charlie Epstein's research that struck me as being, anti, you know, part of this industrial complex as Kaczynski envisioned things. No, I mean, he was in favor of... He ran the medical genetics um, center at UCSF for a long time, which was something that attracted me because I wanted to work in genetic counseling and uh, advise people with genetic disease. And it was a fantastic clinic where you looked at the whole person and you know, to understand their socioeconomic background, their social background, the family, everything about it, as well as the genetics of the disorder and explain it to them. So he... He was a, a real pioneer in medical genetics and in prenatal detection of disease. And um, I don't know, maybe it was the prenatal detection of disease that bothered Kaczynski, or maybe he was misinformed. Uh, it was a tragedy what happened. To Terribly tragic. Charlie. Hard, hard to read a yeah, He mind. lost a couple of fingers, but he was such an upbeat yeah. guy that he said to me, luckily, I can still play the cello because it was the other hand. Wow. And his daughter yeah. actually almost opened that package, I recall, but he decided yeah. to open it and intervene. Yeah. And, uh, in talking about genetic counseling, I'm inclined to ask you, I was very involved in an international project to uh, 
have people talk about and be interviewed about CRISPR, and I'm still really curious about mm. it. Uh, again, we're talking about promise and all these things with research. Where do you see CRISPR? Oh, I think uh, CRISPR is a fantastic technology, and I'm, I, I know Jennifer Dadna quite well and really admire her. She deserves a Nobel, I'm told. Oh, absolutely. She really, really does. And um, it's, it's a fantastic development, first of all, for experiments. It's amazing because you can look at easily look at loss of function, gain of function of different genes. You can manipulate gene expression and really understand it at a level that we couldn't before. But it also has tremendous promise for treating disease. And um, for instance, recently there was a, an approval by the FDA for sickle cell anemia, which has been a devastating disease. There are 20 million people afflicted by this disease. And it's due to a mutation that leads to a change in one amino acid of, of hemoglobin. And, and that's enough to cause the hemoglobin, uh, the red blood cells from being, you know, flexible Frisbee-like cells that can squeeze through blood vessels uh, to becoming rigid and sickle-like. And, and then they're destroyed early and they don't bring oxygen to the blood as is needed. And it's associated with tremendous pain and uh, afflicts people in Africa primarily. Um, so now with CRISPR, they've been able to take the blood of a person and activate the fetal hemoglobin and uh, and then replace the cells and um, eliminate many of the, the effects of the disease. It's not all that straightforward. There's still a lot of problems that have to be worked out, but it shows you the promise of the disease. I mean, of the approach of CRISPR. Amazing promise, yeah. Yes, Extraordinary. yes. Yeah. I mean, there's still worries with off-target effects. You could, uh, you don't always correct only uh, the gene you want to correct. You sometimes have effects on other genes, and that's a worry. So that's why we're using it primarily for therapy anyway, ex vivo, which means you take the cells out, engineer them, look for quality control before you put them back. Uh, eventually, though, I could imagine it being so accurate that you could use it in vivo, and I think it's it's a breakthrough. Yeah, that's really. what I was imagined at this whole conference I was involved in. Uh, <laughs> so your imaginations are running concurrently, uh, I, yeah. and we're getting some questions already. Let me go to them. This is Brian from Los Angeles who says, as a prominent figure in the field, what challenges do you think researchers face in translating stem cell therapies from the lab to clinical applications? Hmm. Good question. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. Uh, one of the major problems, I think, and challenges is how expensive it is. So, for instance, this CRISPR treatment uh, and many of the, the stem cell treatments that are, are ongoing, like for macular degeneration and, um, and for corneal treatments, they, they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a treatment. That's not really uh, something that's going to be affordable in Africa for sickle cell anemia, for instance. So I think the price has to come way down. Um, and that is one of the major obstacles. So right now it's uh, in the scientific range realm. I was just uh, talking with my friend Alex uh, about Rwanda, just as a singular example, mm. building up its economy and, and yeah. through all kinds of different ways. In fact, uh, Alex built a school there. Um, mm. And African nations, uh, some of them are really prospering a lot with Chinese help, of course, but to the degree that they can, maybe one hopes, afford some of these things, but they are extraordinarily expensive. Here's Lauren from Seattle who wants to know, can you discuss the importance of education and public awareness in shaping attitudes towards stem cell research and its potential benefits? Thank you, Lauren. Oh, yes, we, we need to educate the public. There's no doubt that we need to, as scientists, be more vocal about uh, the promise of these treatments, how important they are, and um, and allay any kinds of fears that the public might have. Yeah, very important. And again, thank you for the question, Lauren. You know, I was just looking at uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee's book, which uh, I'm a, I'm a fan of his work. He's a Columbia medical professor and uh, wrote a book called The Gene, and also wrote a book called The Emperor of All Maladies. But his most yes. recent book is called The Story of the Cell. And what he argues essentially is that everything is cellular, you know, um, and he makes the point that the whole world uh, is, uh, is cellular. The, is, the yeah. world is made up of cellular ecosystems. The human 
body obviously is totally cellular and everything. We don't understand really our own organisms until we understand all these cellular pathways and all these labyrinthine and yeah. enigmatic traversing areas of cells. I think that's something yeah. that we can both completely agree on, right? I think so. I think uh, cells are integral to life, to existence. And um, so in in speaking to this, the, the last questioner, uh, one of the reasons I recently just finished writing a book, um, it's on stem cells for children, because I know that people will invest in books for children. And I want to educate not just the children, but also the parents who read the books to the children. And and this is my way of making them aware and doing my bit to, to uh, help educate the public on what stem cells can do. Uh, it's called Stem Cells to the Rescue, and it's to um, tell children how you have stem cells in most of the tissues of your body. And when you're injured, they come to your rescue and they repair the damage. And then it goes into also with aging, as your stem cells no longer function so well, what you can do, what the promise is, for instance, for your joints. People are having hip replacements and knee replacements. Could you stimulate the stem cells that exist in your joints to uh, regenerate that tissue? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, what about our aging brains? We know the stem cells are there in the aging brain. Can we find ways to stimulate those stem cells? in order to help you remember names better, for instance, as, as you get older. And um, I think there's tremendous promise and a lot of research is being done now, uh, not just for things like vision, where I think it would also have an enormous impact, macular degeneration, corneal abrasions, um, enlisting our stem cells to, to repair damage, rejuvenating them, um, and using them in therapy, I think, has a lot of promise. And uh, I want to educate the public about that. Well, what congratulations ahead about. of time on the book. And uh, it's good early promotion. And I hope you have <laughs> uh, major success with it. It's it's great that kids are being educated about all this. And you've got this private company now, uh, this biopharmaceutical company, all involved with regeneration and building of muscle strength uh, and some exciting things that are really attendant upon the work that you've done, which I congratulate you for and, and sort of Thank excited you. following of all these healing mechanisms, building muscle strength. Uh, I mean, it's, it's exciting stuff. Some of it with small molecular drugs, but also um, helping things like Brody syndrome. And um, in fact, your lab just recently came out with a discovery about, uh, uh, and this is your word, I think, isn't it? Gerozyme? Gerozyme? Yes, it's, yes, it is. Uh, Gerozyme. We discovered that um, there's an enzyme that increases with aging uh, in muscle, but not just in muscle, also other tissues. So it may be, it, it appears to be a master regulator of aging in muscle. Uh, if we overexpress it, and what it does is it's uh, the prostaglandin degrading enzyme. So it, it decreases PGE2 levels. And it, we don't know why it increases, but a lot of things that are not so good happen with aging. And this goes up maybe twofold, just a little bit, modulates the levels of PGE2. They decrease somewhat. And, and that's enough. If we overexpress that enzyme in a young mouse muscle, uh, we see that the muscle shrinks and weakens within a month. So you're recapitulating aging that over you know several years of a mouse life within one month with this single enzyme. And if we inhibit the enzyme in an aged mouse muscle, we find that it's rejuvenated and we restore muscle mass and muscle strength. So it seems to be a pivotal molecular determinant of aging and that targeting it can uh, restore muscle strength in, uh, in aged mice. So we hope that's going to translate to people as well. How much Which is why we, I formed the company. <laughs> uh, yeah, and congratulations on that again. But how much uh, does things tra do things translate from mice to humans? Oh, I think they often do. And we know already that this enzyme plays a pivotal role in human uh, and in uh, human stem cell function because we've transplanted human muscle stem cells into mouse muscles and stimulated them with PGE2, and we can see robust effects. 
So I, I expect this is a very conserved pathway. And okay. we also see that in aged human muscles, uh, there's an increase in the enzyme. So it, it's not just a mouse phenomenon. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, uh, because there has been a lot of research that has been limited to mice and turned out to be limited to mice, unfortunately. That's true, uh, yes. But you kind of laid your uh, flag, so to speak, in terms of uh, your scientific reputation by reversing mammalian differentiation state. Uh, maybe you can give us a lay definition of what that means and what that was? Oh, okay. I think that was um, one of the, the first major things I did when I was an assistant professor. I decided to uh, challenge the dogma that um, a cell fate was fixed, that once a cell was dedicated to being a, a keratinocyte in the skin or a hepatocyte in the liver, that it couldn't be changed. And so what I did that was, was accepted as scientific knowledge. That's right. Knowledge. That was yeah. that was it. it yeah. You once you were, you know, it, differentiation was fixed and irreversible. And so I challenged that uh, and found a way to do that by fusing cells together, uh, taking mouse muscle cells and fusing them with human cells of different tissues and showing that you could turn on the muscle genes in those different cells. And that showed how plastic uh, the differentiated state was, and and that was a. A paper in in science got the cover of Science: The Frontiers in Biology issue, and thank goodness for that because it got me tenure. <laughs> well, it also he at that time <laughs> got you the way I describe you uh, to to be designated uh, as you have been low these many years as a scientific pioneer, which was tougher for women back in that day, and still in some ways is tougher for women, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Um, so when I was hired, I was hired as part of an experiment at Stanford. Uh, there were four of us, four women, who were hired as the first faculty in the medical school. And it was part of an affirmative action move. The departments received uh, a bonus for hiring us and doing this experiment. <laughs> and and um, and around that time, I guess we were 7% eventually of the faculty. Now, luckily, Women are about 50% of the faculty. Uh, it was a tough time. I was one of the first, if not the first, to get pregnant. And um, I, people looked at me and thought, she's not going to manage. In fact, they predicted I would fail because I was going to have a child. And uh, I was allowed four weeks maternity leave. Now women luckily get three to six months, which is what they should have. Uh, but as soon as I had my baby, I was already thinking about how to get someone else to look after it because I had so little time at home. And then they would check up on me when I came back to work to make sure I was there at 9 a.m. every day. Um, whereas the guy next door to me whose wife had a baby, he decided to stay home mornings that summer and he was championed as a wonderful human being. <laughs> so it was a real double standard. Um, yeah, so luckily times have changed, but but that had a big impact. Our salaries were kept lower because we were given extra years for each child towards tenure, whether we wanted it or not. And that meant our salaries stayed lower, we women. Uh, and as a result, our retirement is is less because the salaries were lower for longer. Um, so it had a, a major impact. But I'm I'm pleased to say that in academia, I think it's much, much better now. And oh, that there are 50% women, women take yeah. time for maternity leave. Uh, they're getting grants, they're getting uh, chairmanships, they're doing, they're doing well. And I'm Infinitely better. I mean, uh, not only uh, in the professoriate, but uh, certainly there are a lot of women presidents of universities now, uh, more yeah. than it had ever mm -hmm. been imagined. I've got a lot of questions coming in. Let me, before I go to some of these questions that are coming in, ask you, do you have a stand on... Uh, I mean, as a leading scientist on cloning, especially human cloning? Oh, human cloning. Should it cloning. be banned? So I think it's fine for livestock. You know, the, the new yeah. president of Argentina has cloned dogs right. instead of children. He's very proud of them. Yeah. And I think that's fine for animals and well, you can livestock. Clone dogs and, and cats, you can clone. I mean, mm. yeah, but I'm thinking oh, yeah. Like human cloning is certainly still plausible and conceivable I oh just wanna, it's yeah. it's possible yeah. i just don't think it's ethically proper yeah, uh, I that's don't really think what it's i was appropriate. asking no it's yeah. not ethically uh advisable you want to say why we should you make feel it's not yeah ethical? i don't think we should make copies of ourselves i don't think we should manipulate uh 
our inheritance. People would like to, I don't know, if they had the choice, they probably would want to uh, put the gene for greater height or um, greater intelligence. That's a multiple of genes, but whatever. If they could manipulate it to have better looking, smarter kids, they probably would try to do that. Boutique kids. First of all, I don't think we... They call them, I think. Yeah, boutique kids. First of all, I don't think we can manipulate the genes so well and target them so well. So you could be causing cancer and off-target effects that are not so so advisable. So we're not even at that point to do that safely. Um, And ethically, I don't think it's a good idea. Well, it's a good idea to get some more questions here because people have questions for you and I want to bring them in. Reed is in Santa Rosa and he says, does CRISPR technology relate to your research? Hmm. Um, Yes, for understanding fundamental mechanisms. We want to understand uh, how PGE2 is is altering the stem cells. It inheritably rejuvenates the stem cell function. How is that happening? Um, and we can look at the reg, and we want to understand, for instance, this gerozyme, what causes it to increase with aging. And to do that, we use CRISPR to knock out various things that would bind to the promoters or enhancer of the uh, PGDH gene. And, and that's helping us to understand what regulates it and also other ways that we might alter it. Rather than blocking enzyme activity, we could block the synthesis of the enzyme. So uh, understanding it, um, sure, it plays a big role. We all use it in our lab. If you've just joined us, we're talking to Professor and Dr. Helen Blau, uh, leading scientist and uh, expert in stem cell biology. Here's Sam from Seattle who says, how much does the U.S. medical system with all of its problems underwrite therapy innovation that impacts the rest of the world? I think that the United States is still the leader worldwide. It is. Uh, yeah. In terms of uh, technology and biology, for sure. It's uh, groundbreaking and setting the stage. Certainly for technologies, the technologies are so expensive. Um, it's hard in other countries to do what we do. Lisa from San Francisco wants to know, what role do you believe patient advocacy groups can play in advancing stem cell research and ensuring it's responsible and equitable development. I think we can do a lot. I would really um, encourage advocacy at at all levels. Uh, We need to inform the public about what science can do, including stem cells, but also vaccines and uh, so much that affects our health, Uh, anti-obesity drugs that are now coming on the market and helping people for obese. Um, there's so much that science does. We need to educate the public. We need to be advocates and we need to raise money so that more of this research can happen. You've done a lot to bring women into science and mentor young women. What more needs to be done on that score, especially since, as you yeah. suggested now, about half of the academia and science departments yeah. are made up of women and a lot of leadership roles now for women, pregnancy, uh, and, yeah. and child care, uh, childbirth, excuse me, allowed uh, in terms of t- a lot more time off than in your day. What, uh, what still needs to be, what kind of horizons and what do women need to do to make women more accessible yeah. to science? I think mentoring is really important. Uh, what I try to do is um, send women to meetings, uh, get them to write papers, give them as many opportunities to speak as possible. I think you can you can do the most wonderful research, but if you cannot um, express it, if you cannot communicate in writing and orally, um, it's lost. You really need to be able to do that. And in order to be heard, whether you go into academia or into industry, you need to communicate. And that means you need to put your work into a, a bigger perspective. One gets very caught up in the little details when you're doing experiments and trying to make an experiment work. Uh, You're thinking of those details, altering the pH, altering the cell density. Uh, You need to think in terms of the bigger picture as well and how to make people understand what you're doing. So I try to give um, the people who leave my lab are, are first rate in being able to write grants and give talks. And I really pride myself that 
when I go to meetings on muscle, sometimes 15 to 20 percent of the speakers are from my lab. They're in industry and in academia worldwide. And it's such a gratifying thing to see how well they're doing. A lot to be so, proud of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not just women, men as well, of course. And I, I just take great pride in mentoring. But you're talking about the importance of communication skills and writing skills and especially writing for research yeah. and everything. Is AI going to change all that? <laughs> Alter all that, do you think? That's what some are saying. Uh, well, I, I think it's early days. Um, I do hear from colleagues that, you know, can be very useful in writing a letter of recommendation to put, tell AI, I want to say the following things, and then up comes a letter, and then you can tweak it. So I guess it could save a lot of time as long as you actually do that tweaking and look at it and really make sure that it says what you want to say. It can give you that first draft. Uh, and in that way, maybe it's useful. I think we have to be careful, though, as well. We're going to get back to science and any questions that those who are listening to us live have. Uh, but I want to go first to Jeff, who's part of our team. He's down in Miami Beach, and he says, as a fellow scuba diver, do you foresee an opportunity to repair and improve our diminishing oxygen uptake efficiency, which can affect our dive time? Huh. Oh, wow. That's an interesting one. Um, hmm. Well, maybe, maybe we can engineer our red blood cells, or I don't know. Well, I haven't Jeff's really a tech given guy. much maybe. thought to that. So yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have a lot of confidence in him. Maybe he can lead yeah, the pathway yeah. there. Um, I want to lead us back to science. I think what we need to do in science is is make sure there's not too much global warming, so that we still have wonderful reefs to visit. Here, here. Uh, yeah. I've been to Wakatobi in Indonesia, and that's a wonderful reef. And it's partly because it has a cold water current and has evaded this global warming. But the Great Barrier Reef has been badly damaged in many Terrible. of the reefs yeah, in I, Tahiti. And yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's extremely sad. So we need to do something about global warming so that there are still wonderful reefs to go to and scuba dive and take photographs of which is what I love to do. Yeah, tell us why, <laughs> just for a moment, why do you love, just reflect on what you love about scuba diving. I love getting that close to the animals and the corals and being on their level. When you when you uh, snorkel, you're looking down. Uh, when you scuba dive, you're really on the level of the of the creatures and and the corals. And it's it's an underwater uh, paradise. It's it's like a um, like a jungle underwater. It's beautiful. I and... had th that feeling of snorkeling in Lanai. I felt like I was mm -hmm. in a huge tropical fish tank. But when you talk about corals, yeah, a lot fewer of those now, unfortunately. I mean, talk about yeah. the barrier reef, it's the same thing with the corals, and they're all inter interrelated ecologically. Yeah. Being bleached and, yes, very badly damaged. Uh, so in terms of advocacy, we really have to do something about climate change. I, I really worry for the future of our children and our grandchildren um, about what kind of world they're going to have if we don't do something major about climate change. Here's Jordan from Austin who says, how can policymakers support and facilitate the progress of stem cell research while addressing ethical and safety concerns? Hmm. Thank you for the question, Jordan. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, I think through foundations, through um, creating funding mechanisms um, where you stipulate ethical considerations and make that a priority as well uh, as understanding the promise of these technologies and that they really need a lot of money in order to be developed. Thank goodness we have the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. That's been fantastic. We're very lucky in California that um, billions of dollars were uh, allocated to stem cell research. It's made an enormous difference to the progress in this state, in that field. Where are we going and where should we go with regenerative medicine? Hmm. Uh, I've tried to give some examples. I think that- No, you gave some good examples. Yeah. I'm thinking about maybe even the broader picture, the broader gestalt picture, of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd like to see us increase learning and memory, um, increase muscle strength. So many people, when, so, you know, after the age of 50, you lose 10% of your muscle mass and strength per decade. 
People often don't realize that. And by the time you're in your 60s, uh, about 5 to 10% of people have such bad frailty, sarcopenia, that uh, they end up in ins institutions because uh, they can't do just simple things like get up from a chair and walk. And they have increased incidence of falls because of muscle weakness. And that leads to institutionalization. And that's a downward spiral. And it affects your your mentality as well, because you feel gloomier, because you can do less and, and you're more dependent. So what I'd like to see is a reversal of that, being able to, to help people who are aged. There is nothing right now for aging and muscle loss. I've gotten the most uh, heart-wrenching emails from people during COVID, for instance, even colleagues who are in their 80s and say, you know, I've always loved hiking and being active. I got COVID. I was in bed for two weeks and unable to do anything. My muscles atrophied. They weakened. They got smaller and I can't get it back. And now I have uh, problems with balance and weakness and I have to go into an institution assisted living. There are no treatments. So if my drug can help with that, just, you know, even for people who have uh, hip repair or COVID, who are immobile for a few weeks, if you can get them back on their feet by boosting their muscles, I think it would be a fantastic thing. It could really increase health span, quality of life. And, and that's, to me, uh, a major goal of what stem cells can do. So this, this targets not just the stem cells, but also the muscle fibers and neuromuscular connections uh, but it could have a major impact on quality of life. And as I said, there is nothing for that uh, for the elderly who are primarily afflicted. Uh, but it also affects younger people. If you if you break an arm when you're younger, um, it takes you, those of you who've had that experience, takes you a couple of years to get your muscles back. If you could get a boost, uh, um, that would be a great thing too. It's also uh, probably wise to tell people, and uh, I'm trying to follow this, there's no age that ought to eliminate or prohibit you from working out with weights to build up your muscles. I mean, just to take 10 or 15 pound weights and do what needs to be done to give more strength and more support power to your muscles. Yes, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to uh, do weightlifting and also cardiac uh, cardio activity and, you know, hiking and biking and keeping mobile and using your muscles and every day because you will, it's move it or lose it. And after 60, it's really key. And you, you see that it's such a downward spiral in the late seventies and eighties. Um, and you can't get it back. You need to maintain it. You won't build it. You need to maintain <laughs> I should mention also that you have 20 patents, I believe. Uh, that yeah. means uh, you're on record as having been either an inventor or co-inventor for 20. Can tell us what you what's what's in the uh, quiver there, yeah. in those 20 patents? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm in the National Academy of Inventors and, and the OTL Hall of Fame. Um, it, because it's a great source of uh, fun for me to... To create, and I've been lucky to have you know it, it takes a team. I've been extremely lucky to have really good scientists working with me in my lab. Her creative. Some of these have been for um, assays, just for testing different drugs. It's called beta gal complementation, a way to look at protein protein interactions, and it's been extremely useful. Some of the assays we developed have been useful in screening for drugs that are anti cancer drugs. Um, Lefkowitz, who got the Nobel Prize for understanding um, ligands of GPCRs, used many of our kits that were developed by Discoverex that licensed the patents from Stanford. Um, so some of my patents have been along those lines, just technology development that's useful for drug screening. And then more recently, these two rejuvenation companies, uh, Aperium, that is developing the drug the, that targets the gerozyme to increase muscle function, um, which, uh, yeah, may be key with these um, anti-obesity drugs. These anti-obesity drugs are associated with some frailty. So you lose the, the weight, but if you lose your muscle strength, that's not so good either. So it may be that this will be 
something that's important in that respect. Uh, and definitely with aging, maybe with um, genetic disease of muscle wasting. So uh, I've translated it more recently. I've gotten more passionate about translation. Many of my discoveries have been very fundamental, basic findings. But to to see something from the lab translated to human uh, health span, helping people, that that to me would be a dream come true. And so rejuvenation technologies for telomere extension is one approach, and the other is targeting uh, the gerozyme in, in order to repair muscle damage more quickly. You're kind of intimating that creativity is involved, too. How, how does that play its role? Creativity? Yeah, I mean, especially when you're coming up with these new ideas that lead to inventions and patents and so forth. Oh, that's the fun. That's the fun, is challenging dogma, uh, trying new things. Um, it's been a hallmark of my lab. I think it's the kind of person I attract. Um, you know, it's high risk, high gain. Uh, the people who come to my lab are full of ideas and want to take risks and not do me too experiments. That's That's not of interest to me. I want to always challenge uh, what's known and try and come up with new things. Well, since you mentioned Me fun. Too, uh, uh, and we've been <laughs> talking about women in science, uh, there are male scientists who have gone on record saying that they used to be mentors to women, but now they don't want to play that role because it's too <laughs> volatile or too makes them vulnerable to charges, even if they're not interested in doing anything that would be inappropriate or and proper. Uh, and that's a problem, I think, isn't it? Oh, I think it's a problem in our culture altogether right now. Um, you worry about anything you do. I hear from colleagues, they're worried about teaching many of the subjects they used to teach because maybe it'll be misinterpreted in terms of diversity, equality, uh, sexuality. You're on, you know, right? <laughs> Walking on, on, Ice. <laughs> it's like yeah, you really have to be extremely careful now what you say. It's no matter what it is. So I think we all have to be very mindful of people's feelings and and maybe it's a good thing to be more sensitive and aware. I think that um women were put down. There's a history of it. And some of what's happening uh in terms of men, it's it's a great shame, but but it's an example that they have to be more careful and more mindful. Um, but I think it's with respect to everything, not just women. Uh, no, I generally agree. We need to work on, to use your word, the inflammation, though. Um, that's a lot of work that you do on other kinds of inflammations. And I've got some more questions here. This is Ethan from San Diego. Wants to know, in your opinion, what are the most promising avenues for the application of stem cell therapies in treating currently incurable diseases or conditions? I think the first we'll see are, for instance, in places like the eye, and that's because it's um, localized, immunoprivileged, uh, so you can see what you're doing if it's, no pun intended, <laughs> but but with the eye, you can, you can see whether the stem cells are working, whether you need to take them out. There's still worries about cancer, so we need to be mindful and, and watch. Uh, I think with hearing is one of the things that I think is very exciting. Mm. We've discovered that there are stem cells, hair stem cells in the ear. Um, and one of the things I think would be tremendously exciting, we all know that with aging, people are using more hearing aids and having trouble uh, with hearing. Also, I think this next generation is going to have more trouble with hearing because they go to such loud concerts and are constantly in restaurants that have very high noise levels. I think there'll be more hearing problems younger with that generation than ours. Uh, but there's a great need for hearing. And in, one of my uh, fantasies would be that instead of having hearing devices behind your ear, that we stimulate the stem cells in your ear so that they can function better and, um, and restore your hearing. That's one area I think that has great promise that um, we'll see in the near future. I would also like to see uh, cartilage. I think there's a chance that we can stimulate cartilage and uh, get it to rejuvenate, regenerate. And that would be a major uh, step forward too, not to need all these knee replacements and hip replacements, but to stimulate your own cartilage to regrow and make your joints feel lubricated and, 
and get rid of the pain that so many people have. I think those are things on the horizon in addition to the muscle that I talked about. Um, and what else? These skin disorders, but those are very rare uh, skin disorders. Um, yeah, or sickle cell anemia. Do you think there's been maybe partially or sporadically too much of a panacea associated with stem cells? No. No. They haven't been overhyped or overinflated in terms of. No, uh, I think they have tremendous promise. Um, are they going to do everything all at once? No, it's too expensive right now. Uh, I think these approaches, though, that's what I like about an approach of stimulating the stem cells that are in your body. That's not so expensive. If you could give a small molecule drug, put it in the ear and stimulate your hearing, uh, get your endogenous stem cells that are there to function better, that'd be fabulous. And those those kinds of treatments and the one I'm talking about for muscle, they're not so expensive because you are stimulating the stem cells that are there. It's a regular kind of drug that you give a small molecule drug. Um, has there been too much hype? Huh? Nah. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at some comments that are coming in here that yeah. I just want to read quickly. This is uh, Reed again who says, as an active septuagenarian, I take great encouragement from Dr. Blau's comments about maintaining strength while aging, followed by an exclamation mark. And then Sharon from San Rafael says, thank you for the important research and work that you do. That kind of gratitude means a lot to you, doesn't it? I oh, mean, yeah. Uh, it it validates what you do and makes you feel good, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And here's one from Mexico City. He says, do you think stem cell re therapy will replace the need for organ replacement? Oh, that's a good point. I'm glad you raised that. Um, which is that I think one of the breakthroughs in stem cell biology right now is the development of what's called organoids, where you can take um, the one of the pioneers in that is Hans Klavers, who has taken uh, cells from the gut, from the intestine, and you can put them in culture and you can get these stem cells, uh, not only to make lots of copies of themselves, but to self-organize and to make little mini guts. And people are making mini brains as well. And it's fascinating because you take the same factors. A lot of and... mini brains are out there already, we should mention. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But it is fascinating. And maybe we can right? transplant these, you yeah. know, because this could be a future for, I don't know, if you think Brave New World of making mini hearts and, and instead of transplants, you could use your own cells that are immunologically matched, genetically matched uh, to you um, and make these mini organs. And, and eventually they'll be bigger organs because right now they're mini organs. For one thing, for the brain, we can start to understand how the brain develops, and that's very important. Uh, but you could also screen for drugs that might work for Alzheimer's, for different kinds of brain disorders. These organoids are fantastic. And you take the same factors, uh, growth factors, and you give them in different doses and in different sequences, and you end up with a mini brain or a mini gut. And that fascinates me. And it sort of self-associates and uh, the cells self-associate and make these little mini organs. I think there's tremendous promise uh, with that, not just for understanding development, for which there's a, a lot we can do, but also maybe even transplanting organs in the future. One of our listeners wants to know, any hope on the horizon for people suffering from tinnitus? Hmm. No. I, it's a major problem. We don't really understand tinnitus. We don't understand its etiology, so we don't know how to treat it either. Um, and I don't know whether stem cells are going to be the answer to it because, as I said, we don't really understand it. It is a mystery. In fact, uh, I was reading excerpts of uh, Barbara Streisand's yeah. autobiography in The New Yorker, and she writes mm -hmm. about tinnitus, which has afflicted her her whole life. And really, she huh. said she would give up everything. All of, I mean, it's easy to wow. say these things, but all of her success, all of her accomplishments, her career, you know, all of her awards and so forth. If she didn't have this ringing in her ears, which she has been yeah. afflicted by for so long. I know what that's like. I get it once in a while. Uh, Luckily, not continuously, but it's horrible. So I'm very, very empathetic to people who have that problem. And I hope we will understand it and be able to treat it soon. So how many mice do you have to have in your lab at one time? <laughs> we have a lot of mice. Uh, 
we're lucky we get mice from the National Institute on Aging. They've aged the mice and they send us aged mice so we don't have to age them for two years. It's a two-year-old mouse is the equivalent of an 80-year-old person. So we don't have to keep too many mice uh, because we can get them aged already and then study those aged mice and study their rejuvenation. But uh, it takes a lot of mice in order to, you know, you need to replicate, you need to have statistically significant data. And that means that you need to be careful and have a significant N, significant number of, of mice that you test. And you're now a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, congratulations on that. Thank uh, you. Not that many women, though, are there? No, it's still few women. Uh, we need to have more men, women elected. What is it like? Maybe a fifteen percent or something like that? Is it? Yeah, yeah I think it's about ten to fifteen percent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. So, so one way that I'm trying to deal with that is to nominate a lot of women, because if you're not nominated, you can't be elected. So. Uh, and men tend to think of men. So one way to overcome this is to nominate women and be very proactive uh, because if they're not on the ballot, they won't be elected. And we're getting more and more women on the ballot, and I think we'll see a change in these numbers. We already are seeing uh, significant increases from year to year. So, What about uh, women of color or people of color? It's always lagging, yeah. yeah. There's so few, you know, in science. Um, people of color. That's part of our problem of our education system too, though, isn't it? That it doesn't necessarily draw as it should young potential scientists or young women who would really be quite interested in science and yeah. pursuing a career in science. Something's lacking in the system, I think, isn't it? Yes. And I think it's very important, something I do in, in the summer, I take talented uh, young students, high school students, even during the pandemic, we had some high school students who who learned to be bioinformatics experts. They were they had a knack for for math, and they discovered a new passion and a new ability. So even when they couldn't come into the lab during the pandemic, they learned these new skills and ability. Um, I take great pride in that. I take a number of women um, into the lab every summer at the high school level, at the college level. Uh, from underprivileged backgrounds, not necessarily Stanford students, in order to give them this exposure to what it's like to be in science and and in a fun environment. I think my lab is fun. Uh, we have people from all over the world, all different stages of development, and um, lots of laughter and <laughs> and uh, good food. <laughs> lots of laughter will keep things uh, going. Uh... I want to also thank uh, all of those who joined us for this live episode of Gray Matter with Michael Krasny, the podcast, and thank uh, all who will be joining us in the future on Apple and Spotify and graymatter.show. That's gray with an E. And we also invite you to sign up and become a member of our growing and exciting podcast by going to our website, again, graymatter.show. Thanks to the splendid Gray Matter with Michael Krasny team of Alex, Shannon, Chad, Kevin, Jeff, and Colleen. And to this episode's special guest, Dr. Helen Blau. Thank you. And I'm Michael Krasny. Bandwidth for Gray Matter is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com.